There seems to be a tendency in human nature to idealize the past, that is, to think that things somehow were better back when, and today just isn't as well ordered or as simple as yesterday was. I think residents of most American cities certainly would agree that with that, be they from New York, Detroit, Seattle, Phoenix, you name it, but I dare say that most longtime Portlanders would believe just the opposite. In the 1950s and 60s, we in Portland had Harbor Drive, a crumbling mass transit system, flight of the middle class from the city, and civic leadership that probably could be described as an old boy network. Today, we have Tom McCall Waterfront Park instead of Harbor Drive. We have light rail. We have strong neighborhoods throughout the city. And case in point, a mayoral runoff in November between two candidates who I think most people would agree have talent, integrity, and vision for the city of Portland. Yes, for all its faults, Portland seems to work pretty well as a city, and maybe more importantly, as a community. When Los Angeles became a disaster area last month, and San Francisco and Seattle experienced violence and looting on varying scales. Frustrations over the Rodney King verdict were aired passionately, but almost totally peacefully in Portland. Today's City Club speaker is one of several Portland leaders whose credible words and sensible actions in that and other circumstances command the respect from all parts of our community. Dr. Darrell S. Takufu helps us find what's good in ourselves and makes us healthier as a community. Dr. Takufu is Chief Executive Officer and President of the Urban League of Portland, an adjunct professor of sociology and black studies at Portland State University, a commissioner of the Port of Portland, and the list goes on and on. Born in Cleveland, Dr. Takufu holds master's and PhD degrees from the University of Akron, and he served as de deputy director of the Youngstown, Ohio Urban League immediately before coming to head the Urban League in Portland. I know this will be a surprise to those of you who view Dr. Takufu as a fixture in the community. He's been here only two years and three months. Portland is fortunate to have Dr. Takufu as a citizen, and City Club, incidentally, is proud to number him as one of its members. So here to discuss the lessons of Los Angeles for Portland and where we go from here, I'm proud to present Dr. Daryl Takufu. Thank you very much, James, for the introduction. Let me also thank the City Club for extending me the invitation and changing your previous agenda to address this topic. What can we learn from Los Angeles, and is there more to come? Let me also acknowledge the board, my board members who are my bosses. Would just raise your hand, those that are here. Uh, also some staff and other friends that are here. Thanks for coming. To the audience, and probably more so the listening audience, I also start off by saying ni hao ma, ayang ha se yo, konnichiwa, buenos dias, priviet, hi, how are you, and to the U form, what's happening, what's up, and yo. <laughs> Always important to communicate when you first stand up, and to tell you and indicate how important communication is, I want to tell you a very brief story that I'm fond of, and probably many of you have heard it before. There was a man who came home one evening uh, who just purchased a new pair of pants, and he found once he got home that they were too long. So what he did was ask his wife to uh, cut off about two inches, hem them, press them, and place them on his chair so he can wear them the next day. His wife said, I'm sorry, I'm tired, I've been working all day, and I'm going to bed. Well, his mother-in-law, who was staying with them, he went to her and said, uh, Mother, he said, will you please cut off about two inches, uh, press them, hem them, press them, and place them on the chair so I can wear them to work the next day. Well, the mother-in-law said, well, you know, I've been taking care of your kids all day, and I'm tired also. So she turned and went into her room and began to read. Well, the man being, of course, a man of the 90s, which he should have probably been in the 40s and 50s, decided to do it himself. So what he did was cut off about two inches, hem them, press them, and laid them on the chair. Well, everyone went to bed. A few hours later, the wife started stirring and, and knew something was wrong. So she got up, picked up the pants off the chair, went out the room, cut off about two inches, hem them, pressed them, and placed them back on the chair, and went back to bed. Mother-in-law was also tossing and turning. She got up tiptoed in her daughter's and her and, uh, son-in-law's room, picked up the pants, took them out, cut off about two inches, hemmed them, pressed them, and tiptoed back in the room and placed the pants on the chair. 
Well, you can imagine the man's surprise the next morning when he woke up and found he had a pair of Bermuda shorts. <laughs> now, the moral behind this is good communication. When we say we're going to do something, we need to do it and then do it and then sit down. So what I'm going to do is tell you what I am going to do, then do it, and then sit down. So what I will do this uh, afternoon is attempt to answer three questions. Number one, what lessons should we learn from the Rodney King case and the subsequent rebellions? Number two, what was done here or why didn't Portland break out in rebellion, such as Los Angeles, Seattle, and other cities? And three, where should we go from here? Now, dealing with the first question as it relates to lessons, first of all, I call what happened in Los Angeles and other places rebellions or revolts rather than riots. My definition of a riot is that a riot is a spontaneous event with little or no psychological or political significance, and it is usually of short duration. Some examples are incidents developing after local teams have won the World Series, Super Bowl, and Watch It Portland, an NBA championship. Rebellions or revolts break out due to some actual or perceived injustice that is tied to a system that is looked at as oppressive. Therefore, there is psychological and political significance based upon the history of those who are rebelling, and rebellion can actually go on for some time. To best answer the question, however, let me give you a short history lesson. The end of the rebellions of the late 1960s led many Americans to forget temporarily the problem of race, ethnicity and class in this country. People became concerned, for example, in California about the tax revolt that produced Proposition 13, somewhat similar to the concern, and rightly so, of Measure 5 right here in Portland and, or and Oregon. Others in the country became increasingly more concerned about the energy crisis and inflation which had become the issues in the forefront of that era's public mind. Some of those issues are largely forgotten but race and eth ethnic relations as an issue continues to reappear in American society. In 1980, it surfaced in the form of a revolt in Miami, bloodier than all but a few that occurred in the 1960s, and in 1984, in the form of an unprecedented African-American turnout in the primaries in support of the first really major black presidential candidate, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Also in that year, Americans witnessed the most racially polarized vote in the history of the United States presidential elections, with nearly two-thirds of the white vote going to Ronald Reagan, while over 90% of the black vote went to Walter Mondale. Finally, in the mid-1980s, racism took the form of a frightening resurgence of activity by a range of extremist hate groups, such as the Ku Klux Klan, the Order, the Aryan Nation, and the Posse Comitatus, which included the murders of a Jewish talk show host in Denver and a state trooper in Missouri, and in 1986, the well-known rally in Idaho by a coalition of these groups at which it was proposed to make several northwestern states, including Oregon, a white nation. By 1987, Klan violence had sparked a massive civil rights march in Forsyth County, Georgia, and a black man died as a result of a racially motivated attack by whites in New York City. And need we be reminded of our own Mulligator Seurat killing and past and recent incidents like the Jacob Johnson case involving Nazi skinheads and the formation of a new local Ku Klux Klan chapter. All of these incidents and many others point to the same conclusion. America's racial problem is the problem that keeps coming back. It is with us today as much as ever, and it simply will not go away by itself. Relating to the Rodney King case, justice was mugged twice. Once in March 1991, when the African American motors were savagely beaten by LA police officers, and again when a jury that did not include any African Americans acquitted the officers of well-documented charges that included assault and excessive force. After the beatings got nationwide attention, thanks to that videotape, a torrent of evidence of racist attitudes and actions by police officers poured out of LA. This was not surprising to me. As a member in the 1960s of a black cultural nationalist organization in LA, but irrespective of affiliation, as an African American male living in LA, I testified in one police brutality case and was, and was harassed by that officer I testified against every time he saw me. At one time, after a demonstration at my high school alma mater, LA High, I was told by one officer that if he caught me north of the Santa Monica Freeway, he would arrest me for anything he wanted. According to our National Urban League President, John Jacob, and I quote, racism is at the root of the King case, and police departments are going to have to deal with it. 
So long as officers presume that black men are dangerous and threatening and that swift, swift excessive violence is the only way to control them, there will be more keen cases. More multicultural training is needed and aggressive recruitment of African American and other people of color as police officers. At least the presence of these officers can act as a break on the overt expression of racist attitudes. Strong civilian review boards with the power to discipline errant officers and to oversee police activities is essential to counter the us against them mentality that all too often pervades police work. The trend toward community policing can help as well, unquote. The most basic fact is that fundamental and critical inequalities based on race, ethnicity, gender, and class continue to exist in American society. This remains true in spite of some reduction, at least to some people, in overt discrimination, in spite of hundreds of civil rights laws, ordinances, and court decisions at the federal, state, and local levels, and in spite of the fact that conditions have substantially improved for a few people of color. However, However, the aggregate pattern remains one of inequality. This is true whether we talk about income, education, political representation, or any other measure of status in American society. Furthermore, for most members of people of color communities, conditions have not improved. In fact, they have actually gotten worse. These basic facts carry serious implications for all Americans. For many African Americans and other people of color, and a considerable number of Caucasians, this means that life is a day-to-day -day struggle for survival. For all people of color, this means facing socially imposed disadvantages that they, we, would not face if we were white. For the majority group in this country, it means the continued dilemma of living in a society that preaches equality, but in large part fails to practice it. Furthermore, and this relates to the Rodney King case in the aftermath, this means facing the near certainty of turmoil and social upheaval. Rebellions at any time, at any place, including Portland. As long as the fundamental inequalities that led to past rebellions remain, the potential, indeed the strong likelihood, of future turmoil remains. All that is needed is the correct set of precipitating social conditions to set off the spark. The conclusion is inescapable. The issue of racial and ethnic relations will somehow affect the life of nearly every American in the coming years. Let me also state that many of the contemporary hot issues, which are not essentially race or ethnic in character, nonetheless carry significant racial, ethnic, and class overtones. On the surface, for example, the Graham-Rudman budget cuts of 1986 could hardly be defined as a racial situation. Nonetheless, if one examines the programs cut in order to meet the Graham Rubman requirements, it is clear that many of them were programs such as Medicaid, upon which African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, and other working class and poor folk have been particularly dependent because of poverty. The same applies to that uh, will happen as we hear about the worst case scenarios regarding the effects of Measure 5 cuts. And let me also say to Vice President Quayle, rebellions and other turmoil is not directly associated to single mothers. If Republicans, Democrats, or even many independents, no, let me be a little nice, if some Republicans, some Democrats, and some independents continue to wallow in ignorance, we had better brace ourselves for whatever turmoil that occurs because of lack of knowledge or understanding. Let me explain a few other things that are going on. A Caucasian by the name of Andrew Hacker recently wrote a book called Two Nations, Black and White, Separate, Hostile, Unequal. I had to state that he is Caucasian because there are still individuals, not in this room I'm sure, but there are still individuals who may be listening or watching this today who won't accept some quotes, information, etc., coming from people of color. So I, I made sure I, I looked and see what Hacker had to say. Hacker located the root of America's racial dilemma not in supposed black inadequacies, but in white America's sense of superiority and privilege. Much of the book is a statistical analysis of black disadvantage. Hacker observes from slavery through the present this nation has never opened its doors sufficiently to give black Americans a chance to become full citizens. He shows depressing statistics that hide the still rampant discrimination that affects almost all aspects of black folks' lives. He notes that black male lawyers aged 35 to 45, that is, as you all know, people with experience and professional accomplishments, earn only 79% of what similar white lawyers earn while female black lawyers in that age bracket earn 93% of what white female lawyers earn. His conclusion is inescapable. 
that African American men have few opportunities in our society, even at the highest levels of professional achievement, and that in turn reflects the stereotypes and myths that pervade white America. Some policy he looks at are number one, he quotes polls that indicate that majority of Caucasians are convinced that affirmative action favors black job applicants and harms white ones. Hacker points out that very few white Americans are in a position to lose a potential job or promotion because of policies favoring blacks. Number two, street crime is another issue many whites identify as a black phenomenon, something that frightens whites, but very few throughout the country live in or near areas where street violence is a real threat. Irrational fears mirror racial stereotypes. Let me bring this home a little closer. I was part of a panel put together by the Portland Chamber of Commerce to discuss race relations last week. I mentioned the times that I get on elevators suited down and how a few white females clutch their purses tighter. It's as if they think I plan on mugging them right there in the elevator. The third point that Hacker makes is that regarding welfare, he says that this is also distorted by racial myths. Many Caucasians say they resent paying taxes to support black welfare recipients, but far more whites than blacks are on welfare in absolute numbers, and welfare costs are a small and grossly inadequate part of government spending. Even Senator Bill Bradley has spoken out recently in the U.S. Senate. He said, and I quote, even though our American future depends on finding common ground, many white Americans resist relinquishing the sense of entitlement skin color has given them throughout our national history. They lack an understanding of the emerging dynamics of one world, even in the United States, because to them, non-whites have always been the other, unquote. Is there hope for our young? Well, Peter Hart conducted some research for the American way. According to Hart, quote, while most young people, black and white, see themselves as more enlightened and less prejudiced than their parents, they still buy into racial stereotyping even when it is contradicted by their own experiences. For example, many of the whites in the survey indicated they had African American and minority friends, and a huge majority said they would be comfortable being college roommates with someone of a different race. But at the same time, many reflected stereotypical attitudes such as the old saying about blacks being held back by laziness and other attitudes clearly contradicted by their own experiences. About half of the white youth survey said that whites are victimized by discrimination, an incredible claim that shows how deeply the anti-affirmative action propaganda has penetrated." Unquote. So the lessons we are learning is that the King case and the aftermath is not an aberration. It stems directly from the ideology that is tied to our institutions and in the minds of too many Americans. If we don't begin to change, we will be changed by change, if not now, soon. Question number two, what was done here or why didn't Portland break out in rebellion such as Los Angeles, Seattle, and other cities? Let me present it this way. Number one, probably the most important reason is that it was the people themselves who had to decide what they were going to do. There were a few, very few instances that could possibly be tied to the King case and the aftermath, but overwhelmingly, individuals found other ways to channel their discontent. I credit the many youth who determined that they didn't want, did not want to be a part of any other display of anger and frustration. I also credit the schools um, uh, that also had assemblies or programs to allow these youth to vent their frustration. I also credit their parents, many who kept their young folks home, particularly that Friday which I think helped set the course for the weekend. According to Lieutenant Garvey of North Precinct, only one person was arrested for curfew, a curfew enforcement that was by and large only discussed, but was mentioned by the media. Additionally, many parents themselves stayed home that night. Number two, community organizations and individuals, such as the Urban League, NAACP, Coalition of Black Men, Black United Front, Black United Fund, Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods and their affiliate organization, Black Education Center, Portland State University, African American Students, the Coalition for Human Dignity and, and Self-Enhancement, Representative Avell Gorley, Ray Leary, Representative Margaret Carter, Fred Stewart, Commissioner Bogo, Ed Washington, Amina Anderson, Joyce Harris, Richard Brown, Bishop Wells, Dr. O.B. Williams, Rabbi Rose, Harold Williams, and Maceo Pettis, and I'm sorry if I left anyone out. <laughs> I think many of us were moved to act based upon the numerous phone calls we received. Representative Gordley and I touched base with many people and were able to enlist the support for the two rallies that were held that Thursday night, April 30th. At subsequent demonstration, many of those named, already named, were also present. Number three, support from our local police department. 
In some ways, everything is not as well as it could be between the African American community and the police department. Neighborhood residents themselves are the best ones available to explain where they stand in all of this. The invitation has been extended, however, to the chief, by the Chiefs Forum to invite all those concerned about the police use of force to attend the forum on this topic on Saturday, May 30th from 9 a.m. until 1 o'clock p.m. at Beaumont Middle School. However, there are those of us in the community that are trying to assist in the development of better community police relations. This is made easy when we are able to work with a chief like Tom Potter, who with his personal philosophy that calls for open communication and his strong move to make community policing a regular and natural part of police work, it makes our job easier. We are definitely different from Los Angeles in this matter. If Daryl Gates were here, there would probably be no holding back by the police or the community. Number four, community business relationships. As with the police, all is not always well between the African American community and some of the businesses within black neighborhoods. But in many areas, it is working out pretty well. This needs to be encouraged across the board and means that businesses operating within black neighborhoods that are not owned by African Americans have a double duty of providing employment for neighborhood residents and providing resources to these neighborhoods in ways acceptable to the community. On the other hand, we who are African Americans must double our effort to encourage and build our own businesses, a move that is being led by the Oregon Association of Minority Entrepreneurs. Now let me lead into the final question. That is where we should go from here. Let me break this down locally and at the same time um, tell you what is going on and then make some comments with a national emphasis. In terms of locally, the North Northeast Economic Development Alliance called for a meeting with business associations such as the Chamber of Commerce, the Oregon Business Council, and Associated Industries of Oregon and selected corporate heads in the metropolitan area. A community business partnership has been established that, I should say, will also involve the government sector. The main emphasis will be on adult employment, teenage employment, both long range and for the summer, and business growth and development. Committees have been formed, so stay tuned to what we hope will be a very fruitful partnership to help address one of the main concerns and causes of rebellions around the country, lack of jobs. The effort here, of course, is not to overshadow any similar efforts already going on. In fact, this should enhance what is already going on. One example is the Portland Youth Employment and Empowerment Coalition that is spearheaded by the Northeast Rescue Plan and the Portland Organizing Project, which Lorenzo Poe discussed here at the City Club a few months ago. These efforts will and must work in conjunction with each other. Number two, African American leadership has been and will continue to meet with other communities of color, Asian American, Hispanic, and Native American. This is very important because during times of economic downturn such as these, Open communication keeps people involved and talking and provides little room for divide and conquer tactics that always seem to arise from time to time. Number three, the Leaders Roundtable and the Community Caring Project that emanated from this group is already proposing graduating 100% of all high school students by 1996. These activities, like those of Portland Future Focus, Oregon Benchmarks, and others have us moving in the right direction but adequate resources must be available to assist and make sure these plans become a reality. On the national scene, I must agree in part with William Raspberry who said, quote, it isn't failed social policies but failed economics, the removal of jobs to the suburbs or out of the country that accounts for much of the hopelessness in Americans ghetto. It is a lack of jobs that make it more profitable for a pregnant teenager to marry the welfare department than the father of her child, unquote. Moreover, the National Urban League's Marshall Plan for America, a systematic investment program in America's physical and human infrastructure, is an appropriate response to the tensions that burst into the op open in Los Angeles and continue to simmer in all of our cities. The plan directly tackles America's two biggest national problems, creating opportunities that help people out of poverty and making America more competitive in the global economy, where we are losing ground. Such a massive national thrust is a necessary step to solve the problems that are dragging our country down. I can't overstate it. Millions of people are hungry for work, for opportunity, for a stake in society. They need education, jobs, and training. The Marshall Plan for America would include such programs along with investment in the roads, airports, water lines, and other necessary foundations of economic growth. Those infrastructure investments would create new jobs and training opportunities for people now condemned to unemployment and despair. 
The Marshall Plans offers a solution to America's deep-seated problems, and, res and solutions are what this nation needs now, not another round of scapegoating and manipulating racial tensions. Including this Marshall Plan with other plans such as creating new enterprise zones in inner cities, providing minivans and buses that can speedily transport inner city residents to jobs in the suburbs, expanding subsidized child care and Section 8 housing certificates, resident management of public housing units and new incentives for home ownership, and programs similar to our own Nehemiah Project and Emanuel Hospital's plan to encourage and provide an incentive for their employees to purchase home in North and Northeast Portland. And finally, there is a need for further investigation into a plan offered by Washington, D.C. economic consultant Paul Pride. Mr. Pride proposes an incentive that recognizes that most new jobs come from the creation and expansion of small local firms and that businesses form, locate, and expand on their ability to attract risk capital. According to Pride, the only incentive in the entire tax code for investing in minority enterprise is a rule that gives broadcast owners a tax benefit for selling to minorities. As a result, there's been a significant increase in the number of broadcast properties owned by blacks. He said similarly, this could work in other entrepreneurial arenas. He states, one simple change in the tax code would do it. If you invest in a company in an area that has experienced a rebellion or in an officially established enterprise zone, you can deduct the amount of the investment from your taxable income. That would immediately spark investment. And if you also don't pay taxes on the gains from these investments for a time, people with money to invest would shift to these favored investments. Once you made the change in the tax code, the government would not have to be involved. It's something to think about. These activities we must start with, but it can only depend on you. If any of these things that I mentioned or other ideas that you have that you feel could help deal with the ills that many are still facing in this country, bring them forward. Because none of these things will change unless you begin to operate and assist us in this change. And so as I close, we know that some of this will take time, but it can't take too long. So I end by still saying, take time. Take time to think. It is a fountain of strength. Take time to love and be loved. It is a God-given privilege. Take time to laugh. It is the music of the soul. Take time to pray. It is the greatest power on earth. Take time to read. It is the foundation of wisdom. Take time to work. It is the price of success. Take time to be friendly. It is the road to happiness. Take time to give. It is too short a day to be selfish. Take time to play. It is the secret of perpetual youth. Take time to save. It is the foundation of your future and take time to keep your health. Above all, it's gold and treasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Takufu. Our uh, first question will be asked by board host Mary McWilliams. Um, Dr. Takufu, I wondered if you'd expand upon your call to us to participate in some of the solutions. Could you be more specific about some of the things that uh, City Club organizationally or those of us who are members could do that would help advance um, ethnic and racial relations in Portland? Thank you very much. Being a sociologist, I, I'm going to say it this way. We, in teaching introductory sociology, we always talk about four main areas of socialization, those things that help change behavior, attitude, what have you. We say the four major areas are parents, schools, media, and peers. Starting with the parents, we need parents who are knowledgeable in these things. We need to find out how to discuss issues as they re relate to race relations, even right there at home. Uh, a few, about a week or so ago, I guess I was quoted as saying that even in neighborhoods, we, we need to begin to have discussions about race relations because it seem, seems that every week we seem to be reading about some situation. Uh, sometimes black on white, many times, most of the time, white on, uh, white on black. I mean, just the incident the other day off uh, Holgate, 105th or 106th in Holgate, and going back to the miser, a, a white individual who was also attacked. So those things we need to begin to discuss and talk about, but parents themselves need to be able to discuss things with children. If none of us should be able to go into a neighborhood and have a young child of any race or ethnicity call us uh, a, a racial slur. Uh, that still happens and still occurs. Also moving in terms of schools, we need to make sure that we have multicultural curriculum as a part of the school system. 
Uh, we have African American baseline essays that in many places are still collecting dust. We're working on Asian American, Native American, Hispanic American um, uh, curriculum that is being worked on. Some kind of way we need to attach that so that the, our teachers begin to utilize those. And we probably need to attach that to evaluations because when you have some way to evaluate people and you say how much did you actually use diversity within your class, no matter what class it is, I think we'll start seeing a change. Now, I know that means in terms of maybe some negotiation with the teachers union, but we have many of us begin to say the teachers need to sit down and understand that at the same time then we need to like press that upon us. So that means city club members or whoever. Now, the other thing I mentioned was media. Media in terms of really trying to promote the positive things that come out in the community. Now, we know it's, it, it maybe makes uh, pretty good headlines to some to be able to see uh, um, Crips attack bloods and such and such, uh, so many killed in a gun battle or things of that nature. But also, just on the other side, we can go around to different schools, neighborhood associations, find out and investigate what positive things they're doing and begin to publicize that even more within the paper. And even the, I know we have a neighborhood section even in Oregonian, but some of those things need to probably be in the front page of the metro or the front page of the paper, more so sometimes in the neighborhood section, because I don't know how many people really read the neighborhood section unless they live right there. Um, also peers. And that means if we do our job correctly with parents, schools, media, when we get to peers, it wouldn't be so difficult because we know that many of our children relate to the peer pressure. But we need to try to get the peer pressure to be on the positive side rather than the negative side. When I went to high school in, in Los Angeles, it, it, you, you were considered to be hip if you cheered at a football game or basketball game. You go to some gangs now, those who feel they're so cool or as they say, fresh or chill, they will not, uh, they're, too, they're too cool to, to cheer. But it was based on peer pressure. The peer pressure, when I was coming was that. Sometimes what happens is if we start with the parents and the schools and the media, by the time they get to that certain age, we can begin to do that. You as an individual, we also need you to help. There are a number of organizations, many that I mentioned, and others throughout the city and metropolitan area that always are asking for volunteers. We need people to come and volunteer, help become role models. I believe, like Bill Cosby said, that the role model should be at home, but why are we trying to help develop it, uh, and change this society and this system so that role models can actually be at home and be working and be role models at the same time? We need to be able to have those folks who are so inclined to come and give some of their time to assist in that. Just like we've been discussing and, and, and showing and talking about diversity, we're going to be see race relations even discuss more about. So therefore, when you have the opportunity to bring people in, some people right here today, bring them in and come talk to you. I think one thing that's worked pretty well with our uh, Biden Ministerial Alliance and Korean churches is that they're doing exchange. We need to have more of that between more churches, more uh, synagogues, more mosques, and others to begin to talk and, and to people wherever they happen to be. So those are some things I would say that we need to do. Question from the floor. I'm Don Sterling, a member, Dr. Katufu. Uh, the last I knew, at least half a dozen Portland public schools had a very high concentration of minority students, contrary at least to the spirit of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Does this concern you? And if so, what do you think should be done about it? Basically, I guess I've been in f a favor of neighborhood schools. Now, I know basically uh, some people still don't like to discuss that. One thing, I, th I see positive and negatives on that. Looking at the South, what happened was is that many African-American teachers and administrators lost their jobs w once they started talking about desegregation. Some of them still have never gone back to teaching. Uh, and then we know that many things were being taught at that time. African American history, what have you, was being taught at, uh, during those particular schools. And we saw a whole group of people who were leaders today who did not fare ill at all because of going to schools in those communities. But looking at Portland, it's a different situation. We do have a lot of, of um, uh, schools that, in a sense, look to be desegregated. But again, you may see it, uh, students, in a sense, be beginning to major or take some of the same courses, and you begin to see some of the same people by race, or ethnicity, and classes. When I was in high school in Los Angeles, at that time, many years ago, it was considered to be the most integrated high school in the country. African Americans, Caucasians, uh, uh, Chicanos, um, Native Americans, Indians from India, Japanese, Chinese, and, uh, and et cetera. But what happened was is that we began to coalesce and do things together on the, in the sports field 
or in some extracurricular activities, but during lunchtime and other activities, we began to, again, segregate ourselves. Now, I'm not advocating that we need to go back to, like I said, in terms of the South or that. I think it has to be a mixture of things. I think those schools where we have it, we see it happening, but I think magnet programs have been very successful, probably the most successful in terms of, of bringing different groups of people together. I applaud and look at the ones we have, for example, like Jefferson. Everyone talks about their performing arts department, dance, theater, et cetera. And that has helped in terms of doing that. I think those cases, they are good examples, and we probably need to pattern um, as much as we can after those. But it's not in a sense saying that we should not or, or look over some of the neighborhood schools that we have. So we don't seem to be going through the same situation as other schools. I know after even the segregation, I go to many schools in Memphis, and you can point out the schools that are uh, basically predominantly African American. And that's over and above the fact that 55 to 60 percent of the population of Memphis is African American. But what we found in Memphis, other than other places throughout the country, they had more private schools that were developed after uh, Brown versus Board of Education than any other city in this country. So what happened is is that you begin to see whites who are not necessarily moving to the suburbs per se, even though quite a bit of that did happen, you found that others were in a sense beginning to um, uh, go to private schools. Jim Francisconi, City Club member and also co-chair of this Portland Youth and Employment Coalition that Dr. Chufu talked about. A, a brief comment and a question, Dr regarding this economics of these people being left out in Los Angeles and here in our own city. The comment is that this really directed to the city club and thanking the city club. Before Los Angeles even erupted, the city club decided that they wanted to try to hire some of these young people who are in some of these anti-gang programs. So the city club organized a phone tree that in fact happened yesterday to talk about getting some businesses to hire some of these young folks based on Lorenzo Poe's presentation. So this is, is a thank you to the city club on behalf of many people for doing that. And for those of you that haven't yet done it, I want to pull Jerry Brown's line here and I want to give you a phone number that you can call. And I'm going to repeat it twice, both here and for the listening audience. 282-0087. 282-0087. So those of you that have businesses, you can call and actually, instead of listening to, to speeches and marching and doing like this, you can actually hire one of these kids. And my question for you, Dr. Takufu, I'm now one of those businesses. Are you serious? You want me to hire one of these kids from one of these gang programs that are living on the streets, maybe there's some drugs, maybe there's some violence, you want me to hire one of them and take them into my business? Now, is that real? Do Good. they want to work? Is it going to work? What backup are you going to provide? Good question. The answer. What happens basically is this program that Jim was just mentioning was not something that where all of a sudden you hire someone and then they're just lost once, they, once you hire them. The organizations that have been involved with the uh, Portland Youth Employment and Empowerment Coalition are providing that support services. They will be following and staying with their youth, staying in contact with you, discussing any problems that may come about. They'll be calling you, that particular organization that helped uh, provide you with that youth. And also, we're trying to assist the family of that youth. So therefore, it's not something that they will just be thrown to the wolves or anything related to that at all. There will be that backup. And yes, some of them are at risk. Some of them are considered to be at risk mainly because they may live into, in neighborhoods that people consider to be at risk. But we find out once they have an opportunity, and we talked to many of them, so-called gangbangers, who are saying that if they had the opportunity, the chance, they would go a different route. And, and these are the ones who are saying that even though they make less money going the legitimate route, they would rather do that than having to worry about someone shooting at them, uh, maybe not living to be a certain age, or being in a life of crime or incarcerated for the rest of their lives. And there are young folks out there who are considered to be at risk who are waiting and willing and just watching to see what's going to happen. And they are also pressing upon us to move faster. I remember going to one of the, the, the secret gang summits uh, a few months ago and, and ran into uh, one of the a former gangbanger about a month ago, he said, uh, what's going on with the jobs you all were talking about? I said, well, we're still trying to get people who are interested in it. He said, well, if you need us to come in and say how important it is to get the job, just call on us. So he was uh, mentioning something to us, and that is the fact that we need to get on the case and actually begin to provide some jobs. Ted Kay, City Club member. The Los Angeles riots were, or rebellions, were uh, characterized by extreme tension 
not only between blacks and whites, but also between blacks and other minority groups, such as Korean shop owners. Would you comment on the extent of tension between minority, minority groups here in Portland? Right. I commented briefly in the speech in regards to how that's working here. Uh, some of the African American leadership, uh, we have been meeting with the uh, Asian Pacific and American Alliance that's made up of the various ethnic groups, uh, Asian ethnic groups uh, in, in the city of Portland and the metropolitan area. We've had about three or four meetings, uh, combined meetings, beginning to discuss any potential problems that may exist. Commissioner Bogle did the same specifically with the Korean American uh, community where we've had a number of meetings to discuss any problems. It's open communication where some things begin to happen, we can like contact each other and see what we can do to resolve any complaints. Uh, the similar has been done with African American uh, leadership and Hispanic leadership, and we have met uh, and just formed recently affirmative action coalition involving the four ethnic groups uh, where we're looking at the uh, city of Portland in regards to uh, its affirmative action policy and plans. And we're doing this jointly rather than just looking at it individually, because sometimes when we look at the jobs, we may say, well, I have one of this or one of that, but we don't have, still don't have the diversity even reflected there. And we're trying to do it in a collective, cooperative sense, rather than just individual ethnic groups going in and saying, we need more jobs, we need more of this. So we're doing that collectively. So I think that's worked pretty well in terms of the open communication that's already going on in Portland. Dr. Takufu, uh, I'm Anna McManus, Chair of the Human Services Standing Committee. Last week, the Human Services Standing Committee, to use your phrase, took time to think and to kind of check our attitude here in our community and reflect on what things might be like. We remembered the 1981 possum incident, which you weren't here at that time. We remembered um, Credo that was popular with some parts of the police department under a different administration, don't choke them, smoke them. Um, and then we remembered the Metzger trial and the ideas and issues that brought up. And we asked ourselves, and we want to ask you, if the Rodney King case, improbable though it would be, were transferred to Portland, would it be likely that we would have a similar finding by a local jury? Any, anything is possible in terms of what we saw there. If we have people who cannot believe their eyes um, and they get and, and testify such as that, yes, it, it's possible. And again, it's according to the mentality, again, of those on that jury, and then in terms of how legal proceedings. I'm not an attorney. There's a few attorneys here. I won't call on them. Uh, to ask how it works. Some of us who are lay people still have a difficult time understanding the uh, legality of it. In fact, what has also happened and uh, is going on now, talk to um, District Attorney Shrunk, and he made a recommendation that we're trying to follow up that will involve the police department, Urban League, Northeast uh, Coalition of Neighborhoods, and other groups to really get information out in terms of how they find uh, the different charges that are leveled against someone, particularly in terms of what it actually means the assault in the first degree versus assault in the second degree. And some of those reasonings are is that, uh, and I'm going to go back to the past. I did a paper years ago and I haven't been able to find it yet called the Administration of Justice in Black America. And from that, and I still see some of the same things continuing on, even the images juries have of people that come to them in trial, the, what they have of that particular race or ethnic or gender group that they belong to, sexual orientation what have you, it begins to be projected in terms of how sometimes they tend to render decisions. We see in terms of how judges, in a sense, and I understand the Supreme Court in Oregon is beginning to look and see what happens there, but I remember reading uh, information where judges, when they had the chance to make the decision, how they judge a lot, and they weren't even able to uh, explain some things they did themselves. For example, one thing I remember a, 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 uh, an African American, having been African American in this case, uh, was talking street slang. And from that, the judge thought he was being abrasive, uh, being overly aggressive, and didn't understand what he's saying. He really wasn't saying anything detrimental against the judge or anything about the case, but, but because of that, not knowing his lack of knowledge, he ended up uh, in more time. We also still see where when you have people of equivalent uh, charges uh, based on race, where those who are people of color, African American particularly here, seem to be given more, more time. We are still questioning and um, uh, just haven't had a chance to really investigate it even more in terms of um, the whole situation with this uh, 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 white male who was uh, was beat near Portland Community College, where the charges with no seemingly 
no witnesses around, were attempted murder, assault in the first degree, intimidation, and many of us in the community have been worked overtime to see if they were going to render more charges on the four skinheads who were involved in the Jacob Johnson case. So when people look at that and the perception they had, they begin to ask questions, are things really equal? And really going a long way to answer your question, because things still don't seem to be equal or perceived to be equal, we can have that same situation right here in Portland. Thank you. B.J. Seymour, a City Club member. Mr. Westwood mentioned that you yourself are a member of the City Club, and I'm wondering, are you satisfied with the efforts that the club itself is making to establish diversity within its membership? I need to commend the City Club. I know I was called in regards to initial meetings. I haven't been able to attend those, but people like Joanne Allen and others have been there, so I know People I know who are part of it, I don't have to be there because they take care of good business. Uh, I really have to say that uh, needs to be, uh, City Club needs to be applauded, particularly because of the fact after they produced some of those studies and people began to talk to them about it, is that we are even seeing, and, and when I receive the information about who's supposed to speak at City Club, I see definitely a difference in regards to uh, uh, the makeup. I guess having me here, I mean, they had to change the schedule around, but um, even having me here today, I think, is an aspect of diversity. Another side I also had to applaud them because of the studies they produced because that's helped us was already happened through the Oregon um, Black United Fund and Urban League we had always had already had a uh, one one workshop John here from uh, the fund uh, put that together whereas we begin to train particularly African Americans who are ready to be on boards and commissions I don't call us tomorrow because we still have to uh, get through all that we had quite a few people there we have to again match them up in terms of their interests and then look at those and urbanly we're going to be the facilitator of, of, of that information for Oregon state boards and commissions though the uh, my understanding is that the uh, Oregon Commission of Black Affairs uh, said they're going to handle that so we're beginning to look at those things and a lot of that was produced because of the study that came out of City Club. And it helps us a lot. We're able to go around and say, look at the City Club study. You're not doing the job. You're talking, but you're not following through. You're saying you want diversity. You're saying how you don't exclude, but we're still waiting for you to include. <laughs> My name is Frank Bauman, doctor. First of all, may I commend you for the order and clarity of your presentation. It was Thank outstanding. You. Thank you. Uh, my question is this, and please don't misunderstand. None of us can buy our way into the kingdom of heaven, but if uh, one wants to contribute to an organization financially uh, of the organizations that you have named today, uh, where would you uh, direct those funds to go? Well... <laughs> I have to start with my bread and butter, the Urban League, but there's, <laughs> there, are, there are a number of organizations. Urban League, of Name course. Name the Urban League if you don't want to, but please, wh which one would you Oh, suggest? I don't mind saying the Urban League, but <laughs> <laughs> Urban League, there's uh, the Black United, uh, the Oregon Black United Fund, um, uh, and there's others that, that are, are doing some of those things. And I would look at it in terms of programs. And of course, I have to mention United Way because I'm a United Way agency. Um, so, uh, so there's a number of groups, and United Way also gives some money to community. We like it to give more, however, <laughs> so um, those things, I, I would say, looking particularly at organizations that are out there doing things that you read and hear about, and begin to touch base with some of the leadership and see what you can actually do. Because during the times, and don't want to sound like some have sounded as it relates to Measure 5, but it is something real. If we don't begin to really discuss those tax proposals that we're going to eventually have to deal with, uh, we are uh, in for some more trying times. And those trying times will be worse than some of the conditions I mentioned in the body of, of my presentation. It would be worse here. Like I mentioned Proposition 13, Measure 5, same sort of thing. So basically we need to do what we can to bring it and change it around and make sure we, we adequately deal with the human services organizations, social services agencies that are out there. If not, they are one of the, one, probably the most important groups that you can actually contribute to, to make sure that people are receiving what they actually need to receive to make their lives as wholesome as some of us are able to enjoy with our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Peggy Groundwater, City Club member. One of my strong interests is education, and we've been following the CATS bill and some of the programs that it offered. You spoke about the youths needing to get jobs and get out and be educated. Mm -hmm. And some of the things we've talked about are um, 
apprenticeships and business programs as part of the CATS bill. And I'm wondering if you're seeing that as a measure of opportunity for the community. Yes, even our board has looked at that and, and have uh, been supportive of the CATS bill. However, what we added as addendum is that we want to make sure it's adequately funded. If it's not adequately funded, it's not going to work. So that's very important there. But you're correct. We're looking at apprenticeships are very important. Job training for future jobs is important. I know a lot of people have been concerned about the vocational versus the technological aspect of it. We need to train people for jobs of the future. We, I mean, welding is still there, but I remember when I was in school, they were talking about welders, but we knew welders were going to go out because of the robots that they already have been created. So we need to be able to train them. We have to be competitive, not only nationally, but globally. I mean, that's why we, in some countries, this country uh, uh, allows immigrants to come through who they feel are more ready to deal with the world of work because in their schools, they've actually been trained to do that. That's why on the East Coast, we have the whole phenomenon that I don't know if it's really made it out here yet, where you can go into some fast food restaurants up in Massachusetts New York, and New York area, whereas you have less people to deal with. You have there pressing buttons to order the food that you want. Now, what the end result is that we're going to have a lot more people out of jobs, uh, but those who are, will have jobs will be those who are skilled to actually go in there and fix that equipment to produce the food the way you ordered it. So yes, apprenticeships are very important, making sure that our youth are trained and have uh, some sort of skill once they leave co uh, high school is very important. Preparing them for a world of work, that is very important. Well, thank you again, Dr. Darrell Takufu of the Portland Urban League. We've enjoyed your presentation today. Thank you for agreeing to speak on such short notice. Thank you. And we are adjourned. <laughs>